Deep learning is becoming more accessible uh, to everybody, and it's time to start thinking about how to deploy it in your businesses. Today, uh, with, the, with the help of the panel here, I'd like to discuss the things that enable deep learning, algorithms for free, largely. Uh, all the R&D that the big companies are doing is available mostly for free. Uh, uh, the need for data, the need for hardware, and this is starting to become a real issue, the availability of talent. Intel sees data as the fuel to drive a whole new set of experiences. And that's translated into a billion dollars worth of investment that Intel's made over the last 18 months in artificial intelligence and data science. And what's most interesting about that investment is that 60% of that has been in software. And so you, Intel is uniquely positioned probably better than any other of the data companies, to really talk about this idea of marrying algorithms and data to hardware performance and specifications around building silicon architectures that drive that performance. And what kinds of business problems uh, lend themselves to deep learning uh, for our audience here? I don't know that I would, uh, I would say there are deep learning business problems more than I would say there are business problems. So the, any business problem has uh, something that you start with X and you're going to convert it into Y. And y presumably has more value than X. Sure. And there's a, there's a rate at which you make that happen. There's a cost to it. There's an error rate. And if you can substitute a process that converts X into Y faster, better, cheaper, you do that. So in a lot of cases, so in the case of that uh, um, data center cooling bill reduction, uh, they can do it cheaper, right? So um, I. I would, I would really say you start with the business case and then you ask questions like, do I have the data to make it happen sure. um, for deep learning? Well, when it comes to uh, our focus in public sector specifically, you know, we're seeing a strong area of focus in health and life sciences. So genomics, biometrics, the ability to take the human genetic code and then create immunotherapies that are specific to personalized me medicine. A second, probably this, this is not going to be any surprise to people in Washington, we spent a significant time around uh, the idea of cyber intelligence, moving from this concept of defense in depth to more proactive cyber and cyber weaponry and cyber intelligence, being able to do analytics with cyber and data so that we're able to predict where vulnerabilities and threats are. So if you're a business looking to get started in deep learning, how should you go about it? What kinds of questions should you be asking uh, in terms of hardware data, algorithms, and people? Uh, and you know, yeah, yeah, what's, what's sort of the check, the, the basic minimum viable checklist you need sure. to have? Yeah. Um, so first thing, like we just talked about, business problem. Yeah. Start with the business problem. If there's no value prop, uh, don't do it. Um, but um, I would order, um, you mentioned sort of hardware, um, uh, frameworks, Algorithm. algorithms, yeah. uh, algorithms sure. um, uh, talent, and data. As business problems go, pretty much all business value right now is derived from something called supervised learning, a real specific kind of learning, where like uh, Rob, you mentioned, you have, for the ImageNet example, you have millions of images and you have their corresponding label. Um, and that is a mundane, expensive, laborious process that humans say, okay, that is a cat, that is a plane, that's a truck. Um, so there's that, that label data availability is often the thing that is sort of, your access to that is the thing that, uh, that matters most. Um, and then finally, resources. Um, there's not a great, impedance mis a, a, a great impedance match between the standard product development cycle, like Agile, and things like data science, where things aren't, aren't uh, they're not as predictable. Um, you get more data, maybe you'll do a little bit better, for instance, so it's hard to kind of nail down timelines and things like that. Um, Hillary Mason gave a, a, an amazing talk on that at um, uh, O'Reilly's first AI conference. I think uh, there's, uh, like, like Melvin mentioned, uh, um, broad misunderstanding of how AI works. Some people think of it as magic. It's certainly not magic. A lot of it is really this sort of mundane labeling work and, and data prep. Um, 
and a lot of experimentation that you then prove out that something works. But there are significant non-technical issues. The elephant in the room is the legal, ethical, and societal implications associated with the applications of these capabilities. We have a significant gap. We talk about the digital divide. In fact, we have a very significant data science divide. As I mentioned to uh, uh, Tom from, uh, from GW, if we take a look at all the institutions in the United States, majority and minority institutions, less than 10% majority institutions even have a data science program where they graduate people with those necessary skills. And none of the minority institutions or historical black colleges and universities have a data science program that graduates people with these skills. This has significant impact in terms of the adoption of these technologies. It's tied directly to income inequity that we, we see in our country and a whole host of other things. And then lastly, uh, there are a number of people uh, that you mentioned in your, in your uh, opening remarks that are looking to move this demilitarization of data forward. The demilitarization of data is, is critical because up till now, if we look at how technology that's designed to model human behavior has been maturated, there's no instance of it where that technology hasn't been weaponized. And so practitioners need to be very serious. I think DJ Patel in his last day at office, the chief data scientist for the US government, had one clear clarion call. Data scientists need to spend more time in ethical training and they need to develop a strong moral compass so that we can actually gain the benefits of these great technologies.